Hey, last is me, Mr. Wee. Um, I'm going to go over uh, another section that we couldn't go over in class. So it's going to be 5 4. Let me adjust my camera really quick. So it's kind of even. And then let me focus. Okay, so welcome back, guys. Sorry about this. Let's see if I can get it more centered. Okay, so this is going to be 5 4, section 5 4. We're going to be continuing proofs. It's just going to be more proofs, but this time with angles. Proofs, continuing proofs. Proving angle relationships. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the things on this paper or this cheat sheet that you should have. I gave out in class, um, so don't lose these. Uh, the first thing is pretty simple. It's just the angle addition postulate. So if you look at that angle ABC, um, that's just a, you, you go from one quadrant here to sort of like a, where the angle starts forming, B to C. Um, if you notice, there's there's sort of a line that kind of cuts not right in the middle of ABC, but it cuts ABC into two different angles, ABD and angle DBC. Uh, the angle addition postulate is very simple. It just says if you add those two angles together, you get the entire angle ABC. That's the first proof that we're gonna uh, we're gonna start using this uh, postulate with. Okay. Uh, let's also just go through uh, most of the first page. It's fairly simple. I think we've all seen this before. So read this to yourself. If two angles form a linear pair, they are supplementary angles. Look at angle one and two here. They are on a line, basically making a linear pair, if that makes sense. So can you guess what they add up to? This angle here, whatever this is, in this angle, if they add up and they make a straight line, you can bet that that is 180 degrees. Same thing goes for here, only you're talking about a right angle. If you have two angles that make a right angle, then they will add up to 90 degrees. Okay, nothing that you haven't seen before. This whole page will sort of be very familiar information, but some of it is technically new. Um, this is fairly simple. Angle 1, if you look at the diagram for angle 1 here, no matter where you flip it, if you flip it upside down or so forth, angle 1 will always be congruent to itself, okay? No matter how you try tricking yourself, you can move it all around and rotate it. You can flip it, okay? It's still going to be equal to or congruent to itself. The symmetric property, if angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, then you can say the other way, angle 2 is congruent to angle one. Okay, nothing too crazy right now, but I would say the last one is probably um, something that we've seen before in the previous sections, but we can relate it to angles now. If angle one is congruent to angle two, and angle two is congruent to angle three, then what does that say about angle one and three? Again, one is congruent to two, and two is congruent to three, that would mean that angle one is congruent to three. That's the transitive property, this time of congruence for angles, okay? And the rest are sort of a combination of, uh, th these two are sort of a combination between the supplement and complement theory as well as the transitive property of congruence. I'll just go over one. Um, angle supplementary, the same angle or to the congruent angles are congruent. Okay, so, Let's say that um, angle one and is supplementary. So that's how you would say angle one and two are supplementary. You can also say as angle one is supplementary to angle two. Angle three is also supplementary to angle two. So that would mean angle one and three are actually congruent. So let's see that if angle one, the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two is equal to 180, Okay, notice that it's not congruent, okay? And if it's not congruent, we're talking about the measures of the angles. So the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two 
is equal to 180. And then the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 3 is also t equal to 180. Then you could say that the measure of angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. Okay. And the same is said here, so I'm not going to go over it. Okay, so after all that talk about the theorems, we're going to actually use those theorems in the upcoming proofs that I'm about to go over, right? So here's the first proof. Using angle addition postulate. Using that first postulate we learned about. Here's your example. If the measure of angle one is equal to 100, or or just or just 23, I'm sorry, just 23, not 123, but 23, and the measure of angle ABC is equal to 231, then find. the measure of angle 3, okay? So we're going to set up a nice proof diagram or proof chart. So you can write either steps and statements or reasons or justifications. And then the first thing you're going to give me is whatever is given to me. It says right here, the measure of angle 1 is equal to 23. The measure of angle ABC is equal to 131. So let's write those down. And then I did forget to do the diagram. So let's do angle A to B to see that all of that is equal to 131. However, it does get split up into three different angles. So angle 1, we'll say that this is angle 1, and this is 23. We'll keep that in mind. Oh, and um, let's see here. I did not mention, what else was I supposed to say? Whoops. OK, so I did forget to put in here. Let's say that, sorry, so this is angle 2. I didn't, it, it was supposed to be given to you as a diagram, but I forgot to draw the diagram. Um, this is supposed to be a right angle. I know it doesn't look like it, but the, this is, I guess, a really good exercise. Um, so pretend that you see a right angle here. You see this little square here? Pretend that is a right angle. That indicates that this is a right angle. And it, it did not say it explicitly in the actual question. So again, this is a, I guess we'll just make this into a good exercise. Uh, a good exercise in the fact that your drawings are never 100% accurate. You should never trust exactly what you see unless they give you a nice symbol saying what they are intending you to understand. If this doesn't look like 90 degrees, I put the fact that it is 90 degrees, you should know that I do intend to say that's 90 degrees, okay? So we can't blame anybody for their artistic abilities here. Um, but we can blame them for not being explicit in their information, okay? So like as in the book or blue blueprints in the future you might look at, anything, okay? You have to look at any keys or symbols that they're leaving you to understand, okay? Um, but again, I didn't intend for that message at all, so that was just the outcome of what happened. Okay, so we got measure of angle 1 is equal to 23. This whole big measure right here of ABC is 131, and the measure of angle two didn't wasn't explicitly said in the statement, but it is explicitly said visually right here that it should be 90 degrees. So the measure of angle two is equal to 90 degrees because it's a right angle. Okay. And then what can we say? All right, about angle the 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 relationship between angle one, two, and three, and then A, B, C. Well, I know. So I have all these nice values here, but how are we going to set up the math? 
Well, I think it's very explicit, or it's not explicit. It's it's easy to understand that if you're adding a one, two, and three, they will add up to angle ABC. So let's say that angles measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three is equal to the measure of angle ABC. What postulate would we use to say that we can do that? Where the internal angles add up to this large exterior angle. Looks to me like we're using the very first postulate, like I like I kind of said before. Okay, here. And here, these internal angles, A, B, D, and D, B, C, add up to the whole big angle A, B, C. Same thing in our situation here. So we're going to say that's the angle addition postulate that gives us credibility or a, a justification for why we can add those things together and say that they're equal to measure of angle ABC. And now, knowing that we have a few different values, like the measure of angle 1 is 23 and the measure of angle ABC is 31, the measure of angle 2 is 90, we can substitute in those values into this equation. So measure of angle 1 will be replaced with 23. The measure of angle 2 is actually 90. We do not have the measure of angle 3, but we do have the measure of angle ABC being 131. We replaced the values and we substituted in those values that we knew from the statements up here. So that is what we call substitution. That step is called substituting in the values. And what I'm going to do now is combine like terms, 23 and 90. So that's about 113 plus the measure of angle 3 is equal to 131. And that step would be, that rewriting would also be known as substitution. Some people actually write combining like terms, which I actually wouldn't say is incorrect. So you can actually write for the justification here, combining like terms. It's up to you if that makes more sense. Then I'm going to have a separate, a completely separate step to where I subtract 113 from both sides. Okay, again, that is, oh, so this is not sub substitution, but we literally subtracted from both sides of the equal sign. So I'm going to say the subtraction property of equality. You could just say subtraction property. That'd be fine, but at least keep in property for me. I'm going to rewrite that. That will be the measure of angle 13 is equal to 113 minus 18, or 131 equals, or minus 113 is equal to 18. That is the substitution. That is due to substitution. So I know I gave you the option to not have to write these in between substitution uh, steps, but sometimes it gets really confusing to, to where you should write it and where you shouldn't. So sometimes it might be just easier just to write it out anyways, just so um, you always kind of get in the habit of doing it and knowing where, when and where to put it, okay, when it needs to be put, because this definitely needed to be restated, okay? And you did need this step. You maybe you not have needed to make step four, but then it makes it messy, and how are you going to subtract 113, make it look nice? I don't know. So it's just, it gets really confusing. I think it's just easier if you just write all the substitution steps in anyways, okay? Um, and also, for those that are wondering, you could put in therefore. That's a therefore sign. Like, therefore, it proves that the measure of angle 3 is equal to 18, okay? Which is what we were looking for before. Okay, very good. We're going to move on now to, let's see. Another problem, it's in the same section. It's gonna be using, I'm sorry, let me try to focus this here. Using supplement and complement. So using angles that add up to 180 and, and angles that add up to 90 degrees. Here's your example. Angle 6 and angle 7 form a linear pair. 
Okay. If the measure of angle six is equal to three X plus 32, and the measure of angle seven is equal to five X plus 12, find X, measure of angle six, and the measure of angle seven. Okay, well, let's draw the diagram really quick to see if there's any other given information. So this diagram is given to you, and pretend that is a perfectly straight line, because it is. I intended to, okay, so again, I don't ever blame the artist or the software or whatever that builds it, okay? Just know that you're given actual information about these two. So, so far I got the measure of angle six um, and the measure of angle seven. I'm gonna build this little proof chart here. I'm gonna build a little argument little mathematical argument for you guys. So that's four, so, whoops, that's one and one. Let's put in some given statements. Measure of angle six is equal to three X plus 32. Measure of angle seven, um, the measure of angle seven is equal to five X plus 12. And they form a linear pair. So if you want, you can write in, they form a linear pair, but what does that mean? Well, that means if you add measure of angle six, whoops, plus measure of angle seven, that should give me 180 degrees. That's not a given statement. The only thing that was given to you that it forms a linear pair. Some people are like, well, that might as well just say that it does give you 180. But hold on. Okay. We did learn that there is a nice little postulate for that. If the two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary angles. That's because it's a supplement theorem. So that's what you kind of want to start with. You'll just say, okay, because they are added together and they add up 280, or if, if they form a linear pair, then they will add up 280 degrees. Why? Because there's a theorem that says that happens. That's called the supplement theorem. Okay, now we can set up that problem to actually, uh, you know, substitute in some values, which leads me into my next step. Let's substitute in the fact that we know that the measure of angle 6 is 3x plus 32, and the measure of angle 7 is equal to... 5x plus 12. So let's put in measure of angle 6 is 3x plus 32. And the measure of angle 7 is 5x plus 12 is equal to 180. I kind of like putting the parentheses around. It just kind of tells me that you're substituting in where measure of angle 6 was with this whole thing. And the measure of angle 6 was substituted with this whole thing. And also, it, some, what if you're in a scenario where you're having to subtract the two angles and you had a minus sign out here? It helps to have these parentheses in here because the original statement was 5x plus 12. It gets confusing once there's you're subtracting that angle and you have to kind of remember that you have to distribute that minus sign to both the numbers in the parentheses here. So that's why I like putting in the parentheses just to put in originally what it was. And then mathematically, I can remember to distribute whatever that sign was to whatever was in the inside. Does that make sense? So it just kind of prevents a lot of errors okay, in your math. Um, if you have the parentheses and you know where it comes from, the parentheses are coming from the fact that measure of angle 6 is equal to 3x plus 32. So I'm going to put in that whole thing in parentheses, indicating that that, was, that whole thing was equal to measure of angle 6. That's where that value came from. Okay, so... I'm going to say that we substitute in some values, so that's substitution. I would just say substitution. And then I'm going to rewrite this. So 3x plus 5x is 8x. 32 plus 12 is 144, or just 44. That is 180. That's substitution. Then let's do some math with this puppy. I'm going to subtract 44 from both sides to solve for x. That is subtraction property. 
I know you guys are loving this at home, just writing all this down. It makes it super fun, doesn't it? Right? 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 Oh, come on, guys. 8x is now equal to whatever 140 or 180 minus 44 was. It's 136. Since I rewrote that again to see what it actually said cleanly, I'm going to say that that's substitution. And then my next step, I think some of you guys can tell just to find out what x is. Um, it would be to divide both sides by 8 to get x by itself to find out what the singular value of x is. That's the division property, division property of equality, technically, but we'll just say it's the division property for short. Let's rewrite that one more time. x is now going to be equal to 17. Trust me, it is. Okay. So that's the substitution value. Now, most people would stop here and say, therefore, x is equal to 17. That's really good, because I did ask you to find out what x was, but I, I did actually uh, also ask, uh, ask, you, ask you to find out what the measure of angle 6 and the measure of angle 7 was. So I found out what x is equal to, but if you remember back to my given statements, it says the measure of angle 6 is not just x, but it's equal to 3x plus 32. So you know what? Why don't we just start substituting some values? Like the measure of angle 6, let's rewrite that equation as 3x plus 32, but this time let's sub substitute in the value of 17 into 3, 3 times, or into where the x is next to the 3, so that'd be 3 times 17 plus 32. This is substitution, and we can write on the same line of substitution, I mean technically some of you guys are like, can we just write on the same, well I like making it distinct that this was a line for substitution for just what x was equal to. Then there's a separate step for saying what the, the measures of the angles are equal to. Because the measure of angle 7 is 5x plus 12, but we plug in 17 because we know that from step 8 x was equal to 17. And then, oh, 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 you're going to love this, okay. You'll say that the measure of angle 6, you can just you don't have to do that 3 times 17 is 51, and then do plus 32 as a separate step. Just write it all. You can put this in your calculator. 3 times 17 is, I think, 51 plus 32. What is that? That's 83 degrees. And again, this is a substitution. So you can split, therefore, this is the final step. And the measure, oh, sorry, I did forget to say that's the measure of angle 6. And the measure of angle 7, ugh, man, I am on a roll for messing up today. The measure of angle 7, 5 times 17 plus 12, I believe, should give you about 97 degrees. And there you go. If you want to check, add these two together to see if it adds up to 180 degrees. I think it does. Okay. All right. So we're good with that. That's one problem as well. And I guess I have... One last problem for you guys for this section. It's a long one. It's a doozy. It's a doozy, and it requires me to go over to the cheat sheet one more time. Yeah, one more time. <laughs> but it's a long one more time. Okay, first thing I give you is the definition, so be very careful. It does say the definition of an angle bisector, okay, or bisector, a line that splits an angle into two equal angles. So that means you kind of put a line that kind of goes into the middle of this angle measure, which splits it off into two equal angles. That's why it says A and angle A. Or we're saying the measure of, ang of this angle is some kind of A value. A could be any number. But then if it this is a line, angle bisector, guess what this line this angle value has to be. We don't know the number, but we do know that we represented that value as A. So both of these angles are, I don't know, some kind of A value. They're both equal A values. If they were different, this would have been a an A value. We could have said any other letter for the, the other value, but we said this was a bisector, so just keep the same letter, okay? Um, and I'm sorry, it does say blue angle. It should have been colored, but these all came out in black and white. Okay, so that's the angle bisector. The, angle, the definition of angle bisector is a line that splits the angle into two separate, uh, equal angles. Okay, here's where it gets kind of uh, interesting. I would recommend, let me see, I'm going to grab 
Sorry, I'm trying to give you a visual aid. I mean, read it. Read that. Those. Um, that. Theorem to yourself and then see what it says. Imagine that these are perfectly straight lines, okay? Let me see how this looks on the camera, okay? No matter how much I alter the lines and how they intersect. Okay, let me see if I can. Yeah, I don't think I can hold this. But notice this angle I'm pointing with my um, finger, okay? So let's put this on here. Okay, there we go. Notice this angle and then this angle below. They're about equal, aren't they? No matter how much I alter those lines. What about the angles that are across from here to here? They're about equal as well. It does not matter how much I try to change it. Even if I slide the line down, whoops, slide the line down, right? When you say the angle across from here is still equal to the angle here, they are vertical from each other. Even the lines across, because they are straight across from each other, vertical to each other, they are going to be equal. That is what well, that is what the vertical angles theorem says. If two angles are vertical angles, meaning so in this case, who is two vertical equal to, or who is two equal to vertical two? It is vertical to angle four. So that means angle two and angle four. I'm going to write our with one hash mark, they are congruent to each other. Angle three is con or is um, vertical to angle one. It's right across from angle one. So their angle measures, I'm going to write with two dash marks, are going to be congruent to each other. Ask yourself, why is it that I have two dash marks here and one dash mark here? Hopefully, you understand that that means that the angle of, or the the, the angle 2 here is only congruent to angle 4 as far as we know. We don't know. I mean, it could be congruent to angle 3, but we don't know that yet because the vertical angle theorem says only the ones that are crossed are for sure congruent to each other. Okay? Not too bad. Let's go over some last ones over down here. It's pretty easy. What if we had, what if we said a this line AC is perpendicular to, whoops, let's move that mouse cursor, db. db is perpendicular to ac. Well, that means it makes, if it makes, if it's perpendicular, or if it's perpendicular, it for sure makes one of these guys 90 degrees, like angle two. Hold on though, be pretty observant. Don't angle one and two form a linear pair. <gasps> yes, they do. So hold on, hold on. Perpendicular lines intersect to form four right angles. So we're going to see that in just a second. That's what this first guy says here. So this makes a linear pair, and yet we already know. So that means one and two add up to make 180 degrees because of the supplement theorem so saying that any any uh, two um any two angles, uh, what is it? Um, any two angles that form a linear pair make 180 degrees. Well, one and two definitely make a linear pair. I'm sorry to say it, that's a line. Even if you made that line crooked, it's still a line making one and two um, supplementary to each other. That means they are add up to 180. But yet we also know that angle two we said was a right angle because it's, it's, it was formed as a right angle from uh, the line a, B, a, D, B, being perpendicular to AC, so that's about 90 degrees, right? But then if these both add up, angle 1 and 2 add up to 180 degrees, what do you think angle 1 is going to be equal to? That's going to be 90 degrees. We can use a whole bunch of different guys here, a whole bunch of different explanations here to describe what's about to happen. And then, you know what, I'm going to use the fact that angle, uh, the vertical angles, angle 1 is, uh, what is it, vertical to angle 4, which makes them congruent, that would be 90 degrees. And hey, some people are like, well, Mr. Wee, I didn't use that. I saw that angle two was also forms a linear pair with angle four, because so that would make that a 
two angles that make or that add up to 180 degrees. And we already knew that angle two was 90 degrees, right? So that means angle two adds up plus angle four would add up to 180. When we know that's 90 degrees, that has to be 90 degrees. And to save some time, I think that's a lot longer to, to use the supplement theorem. I would just say that angle two is also vertical to angle three. We could have used a transitive property too as well. I don't know, but um, I'm not going to get into that. I think that gets even crazier. But basically, 5.9, you know for sure perpendicular lines intersect to form all four of the angles to be 90 degrees. Okay? All angles are congruent. Yeah, we see that. So that's another kind of right angle theorem. Another right angle theorem is that perpendicular lines form congruent adjacent lines. So again, adjacent means they're kind of on the same side or same line. 1 and 2 are congruent to each other, then 2 and 4 are congruent to each other, 3 and 4 are congruent to each other, and then 3 and 1 are also congruent to each other. So that's what it's being written right over here, okay? All right, um, let's see. This is, just read this to yourself. That kind of makes sense. If two angles are congruent, we have this. 5 and 6 are congruent, okay? That's the example picture. Oh, and they're supplementary, so they're congruent. To each other but they're also supplementary to each other so that means they add up to what if you add them together 180 degrees then each angle should be a right angle right how the heck are you going to have two angles like if you had two angles that are congruent to each other that are 30 degrees oh that's great okay that's fine dandy they're congruent to each other but are they supplementary to, to each other no Okay, that doesn't even look like 30 degrees, but remember, always go off of what's given to you, like in information and what's confirmed, not visually what it looks like, okay? So again, 30 and 30 are not supplementary to each other. They're not even complementary. They're just really, really small values. Um, so that would make this untrue, but it says right here, if the two angles are congruent, okay, and they're both or, or and they're supplementary they have to add up 280 degrees then you can bet that they're both right angles they have to be both 90 degrees or else they won't be supplementary to each other as well as congruent okay next one i'm not going to go over i think you understand if you understand the logic of this you can t you can kind of tell yourself 5.13 the reason why i kind of want to skip that at least is so i can give you the last example how are we doing here? Are we still recording? That would be so sad if I was just talking to myself. Okay, we're still good, I, th I think. Okay. That's happened to me before where I only taped the first two minutes of a video, and little did I know it wasn't even recording. How sad is that? That's a really sad day, guys. Trust me, for me and my time and my life. It just gets so sad. Okay. So... There is an example in your book called, ex or, or, or under example three. We're going to skip that because I feel like the next example in this section was just as good, involved a little bit more understanding, and used vertical angles. Okay, so both example three and four do are situations with vertical angles, but I think example four is much more creative and critical thinking, a little bit more critical thinking than required critical thinking than example three. Okay. Here's your example. Prove that if DB, okay, that's odd. It's a weird way to write a line segment. And this also uses the definition of an angle bisector as well. If you can, try to exercise your knowledge by trying to draw this in your own head. So imagine an angle ADC being bisected by a segment that has an arrow at the tip called DB, and then it forms two angles, at least two angles that make, or that are congruent. But I will tell you, it's a little bit more complicated than that, so I do apologize. So let's check this out. Let's form a long linear, or line, okay? And I'll say that this, this point is A, and then at this point is D, like somewhere in the middle, and then Let's make another point C out here. Let's connect that. So this is actually this was given to you. I'm not just drawing this because I'm like, oh, you guys should know how to draw this. Okay. But and then I have an angle ADC. Okay, so this is given in your book like this. Don't worry. I'm not just making this up. Is bisected by DB. So I'm gonna write DB right here. You know what? I should have used a different color pen. So 
because I was going to do hash marks or dash marks, but it didn't. S the The way that DB is written does not imply you to write a dash mark, so we're not going to do dash marks. Okay. Oh no, dash marks. I don't know why I like doing that so much. This line goes from here to here. And you know what? Um, yeah, I think it does do that. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay, so this is this line here. So the reason why it's written like a weird line like that and it doesn't have an arrow at the other end is because we're saying DB starts from here as a point and then ends going on forever. So you have to indicate that here. However, if DB was represented as this whole thing somehow, which I don't see how, it would actually, it wouldn't be written with an arrow. It would actually just be... Oh, no, I guess it would. Yeah, it'd be a line segment with the, or just a line and not a line segment. A line segment is just from end to end, A to D. But I guess from two points here, and you say that they're going on forever. I don't know. I think I'm just confusing you. I'm so sorry about that. I'm getting caught up in something that's really not that important. Okay. What is important is for you to label the angles or the way it's given to you. This is angle one, this is angle two. Oh, this is angle three. What? Wait a minute, Mr. Wee. I don't understand. I thought I can get this because I thought angle two was going to be congruent to angle three, but no, it's not vertical to each other. Yikes. I could have said, and they, they sort of form a linear pair, but wait a minute. I don't know. Ugh, I'm getting mad. There's no angle here for whatever the, the, the heck this angle is. There's nothing given. How the heck am I going to find this? Okay. Let's see what we got so far. I see a linear pair. Is that going to help me? This is angle one, two, and uh, I hate this angle. There's nothing given me there. I can't do anything with that. Wait. But I can at least say that angle one and three are vertical to each other. Okay. And I know that DB bisects A and C. <gasps> ADC. So that means angle one is congruent to angle two. And we also know that the angle one is congruent to angle three because of the vertical angle theory. So maybe I, I think I got something in my head. If you didn't follow that, it's okay. I'll draw out the argument for you and let's talk about what kind of summarize some things that I kind of found out in my head. So hopefully I kind of can model here. That's kind of how you want to approach proofs. You kind of want to either you can draw the chart and just start plotting away and trying different things, or you can actually look at it and see if you can make any connections and then draw the argument. However you want, you just want to critically think about what's going on. Okay. So first thing that we do in our argument is give or write out the given statement. So I do know that DB bisects angle ADC. And then I also know that angle 2, oh, is congruent. Oh, no, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm trying to prove. You silly goose, Mr. Wee. You Silly, silly goose. You can't do that. Okay, so I guess that's it. That's all that was given to you. So knowing that that was all that's given to you. Um, wait, wait a minute. Okay, no, no. Yeah, okay. So anyways, uh, let's see. Angle 2 and 1 uh, are being bisected. So we can, or I'm sorry, uh, ADC is being bisected. So we can say angle 1 and 2. The measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle Two, or you can just say the measure of angle one is actually congruent. That actually makes sense too. I think that's what the angle, the definition of the angle bisector said, didn't it? No, I, I guess it didn't say congruence or uh, equality. So I guess it's just, yeah, I guess you can just say either or in this case. So I oh, just say the measure of angle one is congruent to the measure of angle two. Why? Because of the definition of angle bisector. That's what it sort of says. So that's good. We can draw on there to kind of tell ourselves that that's what's going on. But hold on. Let me see what else I can say. Well, I think it's sort of given to me and that angle one is vertical to angle three. So if you wanted to, you could have written that angle one is 
only vertical. It's just vertical to angle three. In the book, I don't even think it does that. But because they're vertical to each other, then what can we say about the relationship in terms of congruence or equality about angle one and three? They are also congruent. Angle one is congruent to angle three because of the fact that we knew angle one was vertical to angle three just by visually looking at it. Then they're, they have to be congruent because that's what the vertical angle angles theorem says. So we can use that as our reason. Not only are they vertical to each other, but what that means because of the vertical angles theorem is that angle one is congruent to angle three. <gasps> Wait a minute. Look at that. Angle one is congruent to angle two. Angle one is also congruent to angle three. What does that tell you about angle two and three? Oh, shnikes. Where that is just insanity. Okay. Angle three is congruent to angle two. I would say because of the transitive property of congruence or just the transit property would have worked just fine too and i'm okay with that i think in the book it says can you flip those things around just say the angle two is congruent to angle three because of the symmetric property of congruence you could do that but you don't have to okay i i think reflect like uh the, the symmetric property of congruence is a little redundant so you don't have to do this so I'm, I'm okay with this okay all right guys i think that's about it there's one more that you might want to try to should I go over this? Oh, sh no, oh shucks. Um, okay. Uh, no, okay. I think that, that'll be about it. There is one where it will give you two vertical angles, and you have to set them up equal to each other, and then you have to find out what D is equal to. Or, or you, after you find out D, they also ask you to figure out what... Uh, what is it? Uh, they also ask you to figure out what the angle measures are equal to as well. So you can pause that and take a look at that. Um, but this is a type of problem I will kind of test you on. So just be very careful. Look for problems like that in the book and practice those. Okay. All right, guys. That's about it. That's it for 5-4. So in class or just the next videos will be on 5-5 and 5-6. Okay. All right, guys. You guys take care.